All right. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, before I begin, um, I would like to call your attention to a new journal from the Society for Industrial and Applied Math in the United States um, on the mathematics of data science. So we cover all aspects of data science as foundations and as principled applications, including statistics, signal processing, machine learning, numerical analysis, optimization, theoretical computer science, learning theory, functional analysis, approximation theory, Banach space geometry, you name it. So uh, we'd love to see your best papers. OK. Now, um, this talk is joint with a, a lot of people, um, notably Al Sever, who just got doctorized at EPFL, and uh, Madeline Udell, who was a postdoc in my group um, at Caltech. OK. So what are we talking about? So um, just a quick reminder about the royal emperor of matrix decompositions, the truncated singular value decomposition. So um, we're going to be interested in a large matrix A, which has dimensions m by n. And the truncated singular value decomposition is an approximation of the matrix A that's written as a product of three matrices, um, a tall matrix U with orthonormal columns, a tall matrix V with orthonormal columns, and so this is its conjugate transpose, and a diagonal matrix sigma with non-negative entries. Now, the main reason, perhaps, that the truncated singular value decomposition is so wonderful, important, beautiful, charming, um, is that um, it gives the optimal rank R approximation of the matrix A with respect to the Frobenius norm, or, in fact, any unitarily invariant norm. And those are results attributed to Eckhart, Young, and later uh, to Mirsky. OK, now, a to understand part of the reason that the truncated singular value decomposition is useful, it's helpful to count degrees of freedom. So the matrix A has m times n degrees of freedom, whereas the truncated SVD only has r times m plus n degrees of freedom, where r is usually a number that's much smaller than either m or n. And so the only way that this can be a good approximation of A is if it finds latent structure in the matrix A. Okay? So it um, gives a dramatic compression of the data, and it does so by finding um, um, principal components or latent factors, as the statisticians would say. So what do we use this for? We use it for least squares computations. We use it to perform principal component analysis or orthogonal regression. Um, it also has a lot of applications in data analysis for summarization, data reduction, visualization, and so forth. So all in all, a uh, useful thing to have. Okay. Um, so I have a quotation from a colleague who refused to allow me to attribute it. Um, he um, is explaining why he thinks that the truncated SVD is such an important tool for machine learning and data science. Um, I'll let you read this quotation. Um, um, throwing a little shade on um, perhaps some other contemporary techniques. <laughs> All right, so the truncated SVD, altogether, great thing. OK, so I'm going to be telling you about some um, modern trends in numerical linear algebra. Um, around the computation of truncated SVDs. And so we should begin with the question, what's wrong with classical algorithms for computing the TSVD? This is something that we're um, pretty good at. And, and the answer is that there's nothing wrong with these algorithms when the matrices are pretty small and they fit in core memory, whatever that, that means. On the other hand, uh, we've experienced uh, some climate change um, in recent years um, when I first uh, um, had a computer. It had 64K of RAM and um, um, 540K floppy disks. Um, and uh, now data is a little bigger. Um, so we're interested potentially in computing TSVDs of matrices that are medium to large. So I, I think of medium scale these days as being a gigabyte size matrix um, on a, up to uh, these days petabytes or 
or exabytes or more. Um, there's some other changes too in um, the kinds of computers we use, um, multi-core machines, distributed machines, even data centers, and these all affect the way that we perform computations. I'm not going to be talking so much about those things today. Um, today I'm going to be talking about different ways of presenting the matrix. So in particular, we're going to be interested in a streaming model where the matrix is given to us in dribs and drabs, and it's only complete after um, some amount of uh, time. So we see it little by little. I'll be more precise about this model in a moment. Now, this talk is really more about numerical analysis um, and engineering of algorithms than anything else. Theoretically, we already know how to compute the truncated SVD of a streaming matrix, but I'd say that most of the existing algorithms aren't ready for implementation. And the other shortcoming is that for scientific applications, I'll elaborate on these in a few minutes, high accuracy is essential. You really need this approximation to be um, as close to the optimal. Um, you need your computed um, truncated SVD to be as close as possible to the actual truncated SVD as you can get it. But this is actually very challenging in the streaming setting. And so what I'm going to be telling you about are the um, first practical algorithms that can compute the TSVD of a streaming matrix up to um, high accuracy. All right, that was a mouthful. Um, so let me say just a little bit about the history of this subject um, to emphasize that we are um, not uh, cutting this from whole cloth. So um, the idea of randomization and linear algebra really um, dates back to work in um, the literature on Bonnock-based geometry, the work of Johnson and Linden and Strauss on randomized dimension reduction. And there's been a lot of work on different types of randomized dimension reduction over the years. I've listed some of these uh, papers here. Now, um, in the late 90s, some theoretical computer scientists got the idea that maybe we could use randomized dimension reduction to compute truncated SVDs more efficiently. So they were um, specifically focused on the problem of latent semantic indexing. Um, so. Um, text processing applications. And there's a lot more work in the theory literature um, continuing from there. Um, a little later, some numerical analysts got interested in this problem and started building practical algorithms for these problems that actually work. And um, the first algorithm that could operate in one pass is in a paper by Wolf, Liberty, Rockland, and Tigert from 2007. So this is sort of the prototype method for streaming singular value decompositions. Um, and the work I'm going to be talking about today is primarily derived um, from, or um, I guess the most immediate predecessors are the papers I've listed here in blue. Um, so like I said, there's a, a lot of um, related work and I'm not going to talk much about it after um, right now. Okay, so how are we going to do this? What is it about these large matrices can we take advantage of to be able to perform this calculation accurately? So the interesting thing is that a lot of scientific data has decay in its singular value spectrum. So this plot here um, on the horizontal axis, I've indicated the order of the singular value, the, um, so the J, um, the index of the singular value. And on the vertical axis, I've marked the size of the singular value. And the different curves indicate the spectra of a number of different matrices. I want to point out that this axis is on a log scale, so these numbers are going down fast. So this first dotted red curve is the spectrum of some weather, some temperature data taken from some climate stations in the northeast US. And you can see that the spectrum doesn't go down that fast, but um, it's roughly like 1 over j. The j singular value is roughly 1 over j. Um, so there's a little bit of decay there. The second um, example here is a computer simulation of fluid flow past a cylinder in two dimensions at moderate Reynolds, num Reynolds number. So the matrix consists of the entire simulation, space times time. And if you compute the SVD of that matrix, you can think of it as a video. Um, the singular values drop off exponentially fast. Um, and this has to do with the physics of this problem. Um, and then there are other situations where you also see um, decaying spectra. This is um, a reconstruction of a microscope slide with some blood cells that are infected with malaria using um, a Fourier tychographic imaging system and a 
SDP-based phase retrieval method, and the matrix that comes out of this reconstruction is rank five, um, up to a good approximation with a very large spectral gap, and then the spectrum drops off exponentially fast after that. So these are all examples of um, matrices you might want to compute the SVD of for one reason or another, and in all of these cases, um, the spectra drop off pretty fast. Okay, any questions on this? Okay, we're gonna exploit this, okay? So now let me tell you about um, how the problem that I'm interested in is a little bit different from some of the previous um, settings in which we um, developed randomized SVD algorithms. So we're gonna be interested in what's called the turnstile model. So we're gonna think of the intimate matrix A as being presented to us as a sum of linear updates, HI. And you should think about each one of these innovations, HI as being a very simple matrix, so sparse, a low rank, or um, otherwise very, very structured. And um, A is given to us as a sequence of each um, of sums of these matrices. Um, and because the matrix A is very big and potentially this data stream is very long, we're going to have to throw out the innovations after we process them. So we can't keep all of these HI around and rebuild the matrix again later. They go past us, we get to look, and then the innovation's gone. Okay? So our goal is um, to compute a truncated singular value decomposition after we store, see all the updates without either storing the matrix A or trying to store the updates. Okay? Um, and so we only get one look. So the original application of this kind of model was for one pass approximation of a matrix that was stored out of core on a, um, say, tape drive. So the matrix streams off the tape into the memory very, very slowly, and as it comes in, you want to construct a representation of this giant matrix that allows you to compute a truncated singular value decomposition. So this is the application that Wolf, Liberty, Rockland, and Tiger were interested in their first paper. I came to this problem because um, these uh, sorts of algorithms also play a role in large-scale semi-definite programming algorithms that we've been developing. Um, I was hoping to talk to you about that today, but um, I don't have the numerics ready yet, so um, next year. Two years? Mm -hmm. Two years. It'll be very fast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, and the uh, application I'd like to highlight in today's talk is actually for scientific simulation and data collection. So when you think about how, for example, a PDE solver works, in many cases, it computes a field, for example, in the fluid flow example, the velocity field of this fluid um, at a bunch of points in space. It takes a time step, computes another velocity field, takes another time step, computes another velocity field, and so forth. And so the entire trajectory of the simulation can be viewed as a whole lot of slices. Velocity fields is a function of time, which you can stack up in a matrix. And you can think about each one of these HI as being one column of this giant matrix that's the output of the simulation. And so it's actually very common in scientific simulation problem to just throw away almost all of this data, or um, as someone uh, uh, described it to me, um, write once, read never. <laughs> Um, and so part of um, the motivation for this work is to argue that you could actually produce an SVD of your um, um, simulation without ever looking at the data again, just from a compressed copy. You could still write it out to disk if you really wanted to. Um, it's not like you have to throw it away, but if you can't store the whole thing, you can still compute an SVD. And I'll show you some sort of nominal applications of this idea a little later. Okay. Now, how are we going to deal with this crazy data model, which actually comes up a lot, um, although maybe it hasn't been as widely recognized in scientific applications as it might could be. So we're going to be using randomized linear sketches. We heard a little bit about this in Justin's talk, um, and I know many of you are familiar with this idea, so um, I'll just summarize. Um, what we're going to do is select a linear map L from matrices to vectors that collects information about the matrix A, and we're going to select the map L without any reference to the matrix A. Okay, so it's going to be chosen and fixed. Now, the output dimension of this linear map, the amount of information we collect, is going to be a lot smaller than the dimension of the input matrix, M times N. So there's going to be a big compression of data here. And so that means that the linear map L has a huge null space. And so 
how are we going to deal with the problem? We're throwing away, in principle, a lot of the matrix A. We're going to choose L at random so that A is unlikely to escape from our clutches. Okay? And so the randomness allows us to make claims like for a fixed input A, the sketch is effective with high probability. Okay? Because L has nothing to do with A. Um, the other great thing about linear sketches um, in the context of the turnstile model is that if A is presented as a sum of innovations, because the map L is linear, if we want to make a sketch of A, we can just sketch each of the innovations and add them up instead. Okay? So each innovation is sketched separately and compiled into our sketch. Okay? Uh, there's a Nice uh, paper by David Woodruff and some of his collaborators arguing that this is essentially the only way to deal with this turn-style streaming model. So um, there's no other option if this is how your data is presented. Um, okay. Now, what are examples of randomized linear sketching maps? So here are a few examples at the bottom of the slide. So one thing you could do is draw a fat matrix upsilon. Um, Ingrid made me do it. <laughs> That's not true. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, you could draw a fat matrix upsilon and multiply it onto the left of A to produce a very fat output matrix with far fewer degrees of freedom than A. You could do the same thing on the right. You could pick a random tall matrix omega and fix it and multiply A on the right by omega to get a tall matrix A as your sketch. A lot fewer degrees of freedom than the giant matrix A. Other things people do are... Um, um, pick a random set of locations in the matrix and watch those random locations only. Okay, this one's more problematic, so we're not going to be using this. So yeah. just to be clear, you're using the same sketch for each of your eight dots. Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's a different from the model you're using. Yeah, um, same sketch for everything because you need consistency here. Um, um, you can also use much more structured kinds of sketches if you'd like. Um, I'm not going to be talking much about that. In my experience, basically everything works the same way. So um, I'm going to sweep this under the rug a little. All right, great. So um, let me talk about the simplest application of randomized linear sketching, which is simply for computing um, a basis for the range of a large matrix. And so the intuition behind this method is pretty straightforward. Um, so you can think about A as a map from one space, say, um, um, Rn to another space Rm, and it maps the Euclidean ball in the um, domain into an ellipsoid in the range. And the singular values tell us how much this ellipsoid is stretched out, how long the semi-axes are. Okay? Now, if you're interested in trying to figure out um, a good approximation for the range of A, a simple way to do it is to pull a random vector out of the sky in the domain, multiply it into A to get the image, A omega 1, which is in the range of A, and it's going to tend to be aligned along one of the major axes, um, one of the do uh, longer semi-axes of this ellipsoid. So you can see that that's the case here for A omega 1. All right, so good. We found one useful direction in the range. Let's do it again. We draw another random vector, omega 2. We multiply into A. Um, we get A omega 2. It's also oriented. Um, along one of the dominant directions. Now, because these are random vectors, they're pointing in different directions even after we multiply them into A. Okay? So we'll just keep doing this for a while. We'll get a bunch of vectors in the range of A, which will be in um, general position with probability 1, um, if these vectors are sufficiently random. And then if we want an orthonormal basis for the range, we just orthogonalize these guys. I'm using some of these terms a little bit loosely. I'll be more precise about what I mean in a moment. The key observation here is that if you multiply random vectors into a matrix, they tend to be aligned along the dominant left singular vector directions. Okay. They are um, here it doesn't matter. If they're orthogonal, um, there are some numerical advantages. But if they're independent, random, it works well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, but they're all pointed in slightly different directions. And um, we can uh, perform orthogonalization numerically in a backward stable fashion. So um, it's not that hard, even if these tend to be pointing in the same directions, to um, spread them out into a basis down here. 
Okay, you do have to be a little careful with the numerics, but okay. Good. So um, let me repeat what I just said. How do we use a randomized linear sketch to approximate the range of A? We just multiply random vectors into A, and we orthogonalize what we get. So you can express this as this little template. Draw a tall random matrix omega. Um, form a sketch Y of the form A omega. And then we just perform an orthogonal decomposition of y to get a basis q for the range of a. And my claim is that a is very close to its projection onto the range of q. So q, q star is an orthogonal projector. And um, my claim is that the part of a inside that subspace is a pretty good approximation for a. Okay. So this, um, um, again, is a randomized linear sketch. We can do this even if a is presented to us as a turnstile stream. OK, now you can analyze this method and get very accurate bounds if, um, for example, you draw these uh, vectors from a Gaussian distribution. So here's a theorem to that effect. Um, the first part just repeats what I said. And we're going to be interested in estimating the error in approximating A by its projection onto the range of Q, in this matrix that captures the range of A. And we're going to measure the error in Frobenius norm for simplicity. And the error is bounded by the best rank row error in the best rank row approximation of A um, for some row less than K times the slop factor, which is a small polynomial. And you can pick the row that makes this number on the right as small as possible. Now, the, the key point here is that if the spectrum of A is dropping off, then the errors here, the best rank R row approximations of A, have, are decaying very quickly. So if you think about the spectrum of A dropping off exponentially fast, these numbers also are dropping off exponentially fast. So this right-hand side is going to be tiny. And this little polynomial factor here can't keep up. Okay, So you may as well forget that that polynomial is even there. And think about this as um, um, uh, the error in the best rank K approximation of the matrix A. And we've done that using K mul by multiplying um, um, a by k random vectors, a tall what matrix with k columns. Sorry, what? what? Row, row is just a number. For, so think about taking the minimum over row in this bound. You just get to pick the very best um, one. Oh, and so this symbol here is the best rank row approximation of A. Um, usually this would be written as like sigma of um, row of A with respect to Shatham 1 norm or something. Or sh uh, sorry, Shatham 2 norm. Um, anyway. Since, since you don't know that it's yeah. an advanced perspective, uh, yeah. how would you choose the fastest means of trial and error? And see, uh, um, uh, there's a lot to say about that that I am not going to say. Um, you should pick K as large as is convenient um, for your computational reasons, or your computational budget. The, the, the thing I really want to emphasize here just is that the interpretation of this bound is that when the matrix A has a decaying singular value spectrum, um, the Randomized approximation using this linear sketch is very high quality. Um, okay. And so um, how big is the sketch? Um, the sketch size is k. This is the number of random vectors that we've multiplied into a. And the error is comparable with the best rank k approximation of a, which is somehow the best you can hope for. Okay. A any questions on this before we go on? So you pick row close to k? Um, you pick which... You pick whichever row gives you the best bound on the right-hand side. It's an oracle type so, result. So how do you pick the best row? Because then it's comparable with k. Uh, so this is an a priori error that tells you how the behave how this algorithm behaves. There's no picking of row. It just tells you that the error is at least as good as the best number you get on the right-hand side for any row. Um, so you should think about this bound as giving you information about the performance of the algorithm, but it doesn't tell you how to. Well, it does give you some idea about how you would implement this, but um, um, the message that I really want to um, communicate is uh, this part about spectral decay. Okay, how are we doing? Okay. All right, so the key message here is that we can approximate the range of a matrix with decaying spectrum using a randomized linear sketch, in this case, A times omega, where omega has 
k columns, and you should think about k as being close to the rank r of the truncated SVD you want to compute. All right, good. Now, how do we use this idea that we can find the range of a matrix to compute the truncated SVD? So this is a bit more complicated, and this is a, the technical part of the talk, and um, I'm going to go fast, and um, I don't think it's so important that the details um, come through more just that there is a procedure here and there's um, a high-level explanation of what's going on. Okay, so we're going to be thinking again about A as a matrix as presented in the turnstile model as a sum of linear updates. Um, and we're going to pick a parameter K that controls the size of the sketch, how big the sketch is. This is the thing we need to choose if we're going to implement this algorithm. So you should be thinking about K as being a bit bigger than the rank R of the truncated SVD you want to compute. So we can actually give very concrete guidance on this, but I'm not going to talk about that. Okay, So we draw four random matrices um, with um, dimensions k by m and m by k and other such things. So these are all small random matrices. Okay, And we're going to maintain three sketches of the matrix for reasons that I will explain. Um, the first one captures the co-range of A. We're going to capture the co-range of A by multiplying on the left by a random matrix with k rows. The second matrix captures the range of A. We're going to do this by multiplying A by a tall random matrix with k columns. So y is a, the sketch y is tall, the sketch x is fat, and they capture information about the co-range and the range, the u's and the v's in the singular value decomposition. We need one more sketch, which is called the core sketch, and that's just the compression of A onto a random um, uh, space of dimension 2k by 2k. Okay? So a very small random compression. We're going to use this to estimate the singular values and um, how the subspaces are, uh, how the matrix acts between its range and its, um, between its co-range and its range. Okay. Now how do we use this information? Okay. Um, the first thing we do is use the range and co-range sketch to find orthonormal bases, Q and P, for the range and the co-range of the matrix A. And roughly because of the theorem I showed you, we have the guarantee that A is um, well approximated by its compression onto those two subspaces. So um, A is pretty close to Q, Q star AP, P star. Okay. Now, if we knew A, which we don't because it's presented as a stream, we could just compute Q star AP by looking at A again, and then we'd have an approximation of A. But we can't do that because we don't have A. Okay? So instead, we're going to approximate this matrix Q star AP that's sitting here in the middle of this approximation. And we're going to do that by using the core sketch Z, that third sketch, to approximate this matrix that's sitting here in the middle. So we use Q and P and Z and C and phi and C to estimate this matrix. So we get an unbiased estimate for this matrix in the middle. Then once we've done that, QCP star is a pretty good approximation for the matrix A. And there are a couple more steps to get the TSVD. We compute a truncated singular value decomposition of C. And we stick that in the middle to get an estimate, A hat R, for the R truncated singular value decomposition of A in factored form. QU times sigma times PV star. Now QU has got orthonormal columns. PV star has orthonormal columns. And um, sigma is a non-negative diagonal matrix, and so this is our approximation for the SVD. OK. Um, so again, the key point here is that we use the first two sketches to find the range and the co-range of the matrix. So these are the sort of key ingredients in computing the U's and the V stars in the SVD. And then we use the core sketch to figure out what the matrix is doing in between its range and its co-range. All right. This is not an especially complicated procedure. You can write it down in one slide. I'm not going to go through the details. Um, but um, um, this is 
what you need to do if you want to use the sketchy SVD approach. And you can see that there is a routine here for processing linear updates. So um, every time you see a new update, you need to modify your sketches. And then after you've seen all the updates, you run this last routine to produce a truncated SVD. OK. Um, now, this method has a error bound that tells you when it does a good job. And the error bound says the following. The expected error in your computed estimate for the trunc R truncated SVD, this rank R SVD, is almost as good as the error in the best possible rank R approximation in the matrix A, plus an error. Now, how big is the error? It's this sort of complicated looking thing here that depends on how fast the spectrum of A decays. And so the bigger you take the sketch size parameter K, the farther out in the spectrum you get to go, and the smaller this number is going to be. Okay, so the bigger you take K, the size of the sketch, the smaller you can make the error term. And so the key fact here is that when the matrix has spectral decay, the procedure I described to you gives a good rank R approximation of the matrix A, provided that the sketch size K is somewhat bigger than R. And this theorem gives you a mechanism for deciding in advance how um, K and R need to relate to each other. So think about K as being five times R or something like that. Okay? You want to compute an R truncated SVD, you need to store five times M plus N um, numbers. Okay. Do you ever state those results with high probability yeah. rather than yeah. expectations? Yeah, they're more complicated. Yeah, they're more complicated, so I don't like to. I think that these results are more informative, but uh, these are um, very high probability results, the usual concentration of measure kinds of things. Um, but then you have like three more terms. Um, so anyway, um, so in short, um, the sketches here um, take k times m plus n, degrees of freedom to store, where k is on the same order as the rank of the SVD you want to compute. And the cost of doing this is um, k squared, quadratic, and roughly in the rank of the truncated SVD times m plus n. And this is sort of inevitable, because just orthogonalizing k vectors or of length m takes k squared m time. Okay, so you're not going to escape from this. All right. So enough of the um, technical stuff. The key point here is that we have a procedure that takes a randomized linear sketch and allows us to estimate the R truncated SVD of a matrix, um, provided that the matrix has spectral decay. And the theory is accurate enough that you can, in advance, make guesses about how the parameters for this procedure need to be set. So the theory tells you how to set the parameters. You fix your random sketch, you watch the matrix go by, you compute the truncated SVD. All right. What I don't see in yeah. this thing is hmm. how your matrix is getting so tough. The enemy could be giving you very little in the beginning. And, you know, you don't say anything about how, how many uh, iterations you have to look at. So you should you should think about you shouldn't think about this as sort of a, a game where there's an adversary. You should think about this as the output of um, a um, um, PDE solver. And after the PDE is solved, you've seen the whole matrix, and then you stop and compute an SVD. But shouldn't that be somewhere in the well, there's not much you can say about this if this is a game where um, you know these updates are arbitrary. You should just think about the matrix A as being what it is. Um, and my job as a numerical analyst is to compute an SVD of the matrix that has been handed so to you me. Eventually get all of a. You eventually see all of A. I'm, I'm, not talking about, I'm not talking about dynamics or evolution or sample complexity. A is the compilation of the updates, period. All right. So there are a lot of things I don't have time to show you, um, including the fact that you can choose pretty much whatever random maps you want. The theory tells you how to pick parameters. Um, you actually do need to truncate this approximation um, if you want it to be accurate. It works better than previous results. There's methodology for error estimation a posteriori and picking the rank of the truncation a posteriori. Um, you can look at the sampling distribution and the approximation error, and you will see that it concentrates very sharply. Um, and um, 
the one thing I'll highlight is that you can also um, do low rank Tucker approximations using the same methodology. So there's tensor stuff here too. Okay, good. So um, let me show you um, an example of how this behaves. So um, before I showed you a picture of this um, um, fluid flowing past a cylinder at moderate Reynolds number, so sort of the onset of turbulence, and what you'll see um, is a von Karman street um, vortices appearing behind the uh, cylinder as the fluid flows past it. And um, this is a plot of the fluctuations of the streamwise velocity field around the mean velocity profile. Okay? And so you can see the um, um, negative, um, so uh, velocities that are smaller than uh, typical and bigger than typical here. So the bottom plot here is a video of the matrix, velocity field as a function of time. Um, and the top panel is the approximation we computed using the sketchy SVD method applied to that algorithm. Okay, So this is a 430 megabyte matrix and um, is more or less trivial to compute this SVD. And you can do it as the simulation's running. And visually, there's no difference between what you see in the approximation and in the exact output of the simulation. The difference is that we barely stored anything here, and we got a singular value decomposition for free after we were done. All right. Um, so we, we compressed this data by about 70, uh, a factor of 70. Now, some people are like, well, why don't you use MPEG? Well, one reason is that this actually is an unstructured grid. These aren't pixel values we're, we're seeing. And to produce these pictures, you actually have to do a fair bit of computation afterward, interpolation, splines. Um, Things like this. So, um, but this method doesn't care. Um, this is all post processing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, what was your K? Oh, K okay. here is um, 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 40, uh, I think it's 48. Um, and uh, we are showing a rank 5 approximation. The aim here was to produce a rank 10 approximation. So, uh, as I said, K is five times the rank. It turns out because of the physics here, there's just not a lot going on. This is actually pretty common. Um, okay. So I can actually um, show you the, um, 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 the left singular vectors um, of this matrix as computed with this algorithm. The exact left singular vectors are here on the right. These are the first five. You can keep going. And on the left are the ones we compute with this method. The reason it's so important to get high accuracy when you compute these truncated SVDs is that if you screw up the approximation of the matrix, you get the singular vectors wrong. And if you get the singular vectors wrong, you don't find the coherent structures in the flow. Okay? So for scientific applications, it's not enough just to approximate the matrix. You need to approximate it so well that you nail down the, uh, the singular vectors as well. Okay. And you can see that we've done that. These pictures are almost identical. And that continues for the next five singular vectors as well, which is what we were aiming to compute. Okay, what if you do this wrong? As I told you, there were already existing algorithms for this. Um, so here's one from a paper I wrote about 10 years ago. So you can see that it starts out kind of okay, but by the time we're at the fourth singular vector, um, the coherent structures aren't right anymore, and the fifth one's kind of garbage. Um, this algorithm also has some other unfavorable properties. So you can see that it really does matter how you do this. Um, and it's not enough just to have a theorem that says, oh, I know how to do this. You really need a method that's actually been carefully designed so that it actually works. The analysis is really um, sort of post hoc um, justification and um, um, assists in um, setting parameters and so forth. OK. Now, one more example before we wrap up. Uh, yes. Yeah. Those. Yeah. And do you get any advantage of this? Take advantage of that? Uh, you probably could. Um, we have done nothing beyond just computing an SVD without any introspection. Um, as usual in data analysis, uh, if you know more, you can exploit it. Absolutely. OK. Um, so the last thing I wanted to say is that. In spite of all the fancy stuff that we have now, it's still interesting just to be able to compute singular value decompositions of big matrices. So let me show you an example. 
Um, this is sea, high resolution sea surface temperature data from the National um, Oceanic and um, Atmospheric Administration. Um, this is a 72 gigabyte matrix. Um, MATLAB will not compute its SVD for you, um, even if you ask nicely. Um, and so the um, matrix consists of temperatures um, at a lot of points in the ocean as a function of time over a roughly 40 year period. And this is a combination of satellite data and situ measurements and some rather complicated methodology. Okay, so we've computed the first five singular vectors um, left and right of this matrix to see what it tells us about the global climate. Um, and why five? Well, we made a scree plot and it told us that's where we should cut this off. So there's methodology for selecting the rank. So the first one here is the spatiotemporal average. And um, on the right, you see the trend, how this average is changing in time. And you can see a warming uh, pattern here. So the temperature, average temperature has gone up about one degree over this 40 year period. Okay, so we found global warming. Um, your method suggests that everything is Absolutely, absolutely. This is easy, um, but um, we can continue, right? So the next method, uh, sorry, the next singular vector uh, shows us that the northern and southern hemisphere have opposite weather. You can see the seasonal pattern here. Okay, we already knew that. Um, but the next one is more interesting. This is a mix of the intraseasonal Matt and Julian oscillations and um, some of the seasonal pattern. And Matt and Julian oscillation moves eastward, so you actually get a pair of singular vectors associated with it. And the last one here um, um, is the Southern Pacific oscillation, which is associated with El Nino and La Nina. And the peaks here are all the strong El Nino years. Um, this also has some of the Pacific decadal um, oscillations stuck in. So these aren't pure phenomena, but just by computing an SVD of this matrix, you find out something interesting that actually has correlates in the actual climate and the physics of um, the atmosphere and the oceans. Um, and so being able to compute these decompositions, even without any further um, um, Processing is interest, already interesting. I don't speculate. I just <laughs> um, <laughs> absolutely. And again, the key thing I want to estimate uh, emphasize is that we did this in a streaming fashion, just by running this data through this method, and we did all of this without introspection. Um, we wrote down the procedure, we did it, and this is what we got. We didn't have to think about it. So the black box numerical method. Okay, um, here are a bunch of papers, um, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>